it's hard enough to make sense about small amounts of data, much less big data. There's so many problems with it. Each of them is like a speed bump. And I really want to lower some of those speed bumps and make it easier. But at the same time, if you lower them too much, you get a lot of people that are making false conclusions, misunderstanding and misapplying data. You're listening to the Microsoft Research Podcast, a show that brings you closer to the cutting edge of technology research and the scientists behind it. I'm your host, Gretchen Huizinga. Today I'm talking with veteran Microsoft researcher, Dr. Stephen Drucker, about data visualization, his advice for aspiring research scientists, the long, slow work of big breakthroughs, and why stand-up comedy is an important skill for computer scientists. That and much more on this episode of the Microsoft Research Podcast. a little bit what your background is and how you actually landed oh boy doing I, have, what you're I doing. have a long and twisty path i actually started out as a neuroscientist i did my undergraduate work in neurosciences and i was really inspired as a kid by the sort of bionic man and you know, prosthetics and 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 uh trying to hook up devices to the brain and i got into robotics from that and so there was from neurosciences to robotics was a very logical progression then, uh, maybe, maybe this is like going back too far, but I, at the time, my uh, advisor didn't get tenure. So I left and I switched over to a different group that was doing computer graphics because computer graphics and robotics are really similar. And so I did computer graphics. That's what I did my PhD in. And I came out to Microsoft 22 years ago where there was a group that was looking at graphical environments for social communication. Did that for a number of years. And, you know, I was hoping that it was going to be the new media form, that this was going to be the new way to communicate, the new way to tell stories. And yet it got to be very much sort of hit driven, iterative, kind of like what Hollywood is. Here's the next version of, you know, like Tomb Raider 3 or, you know, Grand Theft Auto 5. You, you, you see this sort of iteration. They're not taking risks. So I got a little bit more interested in sort of just organizing and collecting of media. So I did a lot of things with photos and photo collections and tagging hmm. and organizing photo collections, partly because in some ways this was a problem that we were having at home. Well, from organizing and collecting media, it's not a big leap to go to large collections of things and large data and understanding data and communicating with that data. And I've been doing that for the last eight years or so. So give the listeners an elevator pitch of what you do at Microsoft Research. Um, well, yes, I'm in Microsoft Research, and I focus on data visualization, which is trying to understand complex data and communicate insights about that data to others so they can take actions on it, and uh, building tools so people can, in turn, understand that data themselves. And uh, so less data analysis more building tools so that other people can understand and, and communicate that data. You're building tools for data analysis, though. Exactly, yes. So, I mean, there, there are a lot of people that get hired on as a data analyst, and then they might be, you know, using, whether it's programming or uh, existing tools to do that, and they have good skills in that. But I'm also really interested in kind of reaching directly to the public. I think, uh, again, I think about myself as a communicator even more than an analyzer. When you say building tools, my mind goes directly to the product groups, but you're in Microsoft Research. Where on the spectrum of building are you? You know, I, I've been in Microsoft Research for 22 years, and, and I've gone back and forth in that spectrum. And I think that's part of why someone might go to Microsoft Research as, as opposed to going to an academic department. In Microsoft Research, we're very bottom-up driven. So we come up with new ideas that aren't necessarily what the customers are asking for. It can be very problematic if you just ask customers what they want. I don't know if you've heard of these old stories about how you drive cars. The, the very first focus groups on driving a car were reins, where you pull on one side or the other because that's what people were accustomed to. So you can't necessarily ask existing people for solutions to their problems. And I look uh, at research to a certain extent as trying to break out of innovator's dilemma, where we're trying to come up with new ideas from the bottom up. And sometimes they go into products, and sometimes they go into academic papers, and sometimes they just go nowhere, and we drop them. Some people say that one reason technology is advancing so quickly, exponentially, if, if that's where mm -hmm. we go with it, is that we're using tools now 
that are better than the tools before. And so each year we use, yeah. leading to the question, what tools are, are you actually using to do your work? What do you find yourself, like you have a technological tool belt. What mm. do you pull out the most to do the work you like to do on, like with Sandance? What did right. you make that with? Sandance is built on top of JavaScript and we use WebGL, which is the uh, um, uh, 3D graphics library for doing uh, on a web page. So th this is interesting. It's, the tools that we use to build it are text editors and compilers. They're not that different than what I was doing 25 years ago. Um, so that's that, kind of funny when you look at, at my, my tool usage has not changed that much. That being said, we are standing on the shoulders of all these things. I don't start from scratch each time. I actually really like the open source movement and that we are, you know, Sandance, uh, and most of the Power BI custom visuals are available as uh, open source projects. Uh, we actually got the permission to open source it, and it's it's fine to go ahead and do that. I think is is great because then we are all standing on everybody else's uh, shoulders, and right. then we're combining them in different ways. And I think that is a huge change. Right. And I remember back in the day, um, intellectual property IP being this big thing, and it's proprietary, and we're not going to let anyone peek into kimono. Yes. And, and it's like nobody's thinking that it way anymore. It does feel like uh, that. And I, I think it's great because I can get uh, you know people out of school, and they could be, oh, yeah, I can do this sort of thing. Instead of saying, well, when you come, you're going to spend about you know three quarters of a year learning how to do this thing before you can actually make any right. contribution. And now it's like, well, here's this library out there that we can use this because it's really been pre-approved that we could use it. And we can put this with this library and we'll get something new. Which and is that's awesome. amazing. What advice would you give aspiring researchers? Like what knowledge base or skill sets do you think they need? The way I look at that is I don't want everybody to be a computer scientist. I look at, at coding as the sort of new, one of the new tools to have. So I think learning code is going to be fundamentally important for any job that you have, whether you're going to be someone writing software or a lawyer or so. So it, that there's that. There's also the style of algorithmic thinking. Mm -hmm. All of those things are important. Certainly understanding data is a big challenge and it's not a challenge that's going away. So Having some backgrounds and, you know, programming enough to be able to do the data statistics. Machine learning is hot right now. There might be an overhype. Maybe not. I mean, this is there. We're seeing results. So those knowledge are really important. I guess so, something we haven't discussed that I've discussed before is I, I really look at this computer as a tool that augments our abilities. And I think one of the things that we do bring it that is hard to duplicate right now is the creativity. I like to see people with have a design sense who are aesthetic, you know, can do things creatively and aesthetically in addition to technically. I think it's really important for someone to have the skills to talk about what they're doing, why it's important, and make that accessible for a wide audience. Has that um, been a problem for computer science people before? Oh, not at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, we we have uh, periodically from MSR something called Tech Fest where we show the rest of the company the things we're working on, and that's always fun because you're 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 up there talking about this stuff. Some people don't that still are like, oh my god, you, you, this is you're you're appealing. To, you, you're not really appealing to everybody here, but if you can explain your things in a way that gets people excited about it and, and pulls them in, that, that helps everybody. So as much as the, the technical abilities, I, I think this, this communication is as important. You know, I've been in research, so I go to conferences and I speak at these conferences. A skill that's really important there that's surprising is stand-up comedy. Oh my gosh, yes. To be able yes. to do improv and to be able to take a question, be able to understand that question and respond to it. Let's move on to data. To use a metaphor, we're kind of swimming in it. Yeah. And it seems like the problem now is more about how we make sense of it, how we find what we're looking for, and what we make of it once we find it. So what's going on in your world that you'd contend is helping us? Uh, I mean, again, that's a huge question. Um, and it's hard enough to make sense about small amounts of data, much less big data. I, I find that it's, it's really hard to make sense of data, you need a lot of skills and a lot of sort of experience and background in statistics and and programming and shaping that data. It do, there, there are so many problems with it, and each of them is like a speed bump. And 
Um, I really want to lower some of those speed bumps and make it a little easier. But at the same time, if you lower them too much, you get a lot of people that are making false conclusions. Uh, I'm not even talking about fake news, but but just sort of misunderstanding and misapplying data. So let me make that concrete from a sure. research perspective, because you're a researcher. Um, what kinds of things are you doing? Because I I love what you're saying, and I want that for me. Well, I, you know, one thing that we've done in my group in particular is worked on a research project that was showing data um, in, um, we call it unit visualization, where you show every piece of data organized in different ways to show different conclusions. And that was great as a research project. You give talks, but we also shipped that in Power BI as a custom visual. So anybody, actually, you can go to a website right now and you can try it without, uh, you know, for free, for, ju- for just trying these ideas, load your own data set in there and experiment with that and look at these things and examine your data in different ways. You're professionally interested in how people communicate with data. Yes, I definitely am. Unpack that. You know, one of the things I find about a lot of the academics that I work with or a lot of the research is that they are fairly good communicators at their own audience. And they're not very good communicators. They, they don't necessarily understand when people don't understand them. You know, how could they not get this? And part of, I think, effective communication is to try to put this in, in ways that they can, why I like visualizations, they can see it, they can ask questions about it, and you have a little bit of a dialogue about it. So I think I think that's one element is is understanding where people don't communicate, uh, don't understand. Our visual systems are highly developed, and we can see patterns. Oftentimes, we can see patterns when they're not there, but um, we can start seeing the relationships. And we're, we're again, we're wired that way. So if we can hook into that and and pique their interest and and start having them understand that, that's kind of what what I've been focusing on a lot. Right. No, that's really perfect. It's, 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 it's interesting. Trying to do this in a podcast is, is very difficult because this is inherently visual. Right. There are auditory visualizations, and we could do that as well. But uh, again, so much of our brain is devoted to understanding visual phenomena. We talked about the current tension between uh, that, that swirls around deep neural networks. And this is a, a topic mm. that a lot of people don't really understand. And I don't necessarily think we have to unpack it here. But algorithms have become so complex that people can't even understand them, let alone explain them. And you mentioned a recent ruling in the EU That's right. uh, that says you can't make a decision with an algorithm that a human can't explain. I think there's a requirement to explain those decisions. Okay, so you can make a decision, but you better be able to explain it. Exactly. And you think how important that is if you're going to be paroling someone or hiring someone or firing someone, and you don't want to say, well, computer said to fire you, and so we're firing you. Let's back up. Let's back up. (laughs) Is that happening? Uh, there's parole. Uh, this has been a big argument recently about uh, sort of algorithmic systems for recidivism. You know, how, how likely is it for someone to, to repeat commit the crime again? And they're trained on data. And of course, the data might contain biases in it. It might be trained on a population that's not that not the same population oh my gosh that is such a huge thing it is i mean on so many levels yes exactly and and, you know machine learning to me is is amazing because we've you know we've had huge strides in progress over the last decade about doing things like understanding voice and and objects and maybe we'll have intelligent driving cars but at the same time a lot of it really is just looking at statistical relationships between input and output (laughs) And we don't really know what's going on inside those relationships. And sometimes there might be, again, erroneous data that leads into it or or some small problems. And I, I actually see visualization playing an important role in this. It's very, very hard to visualize these models, but maybe to try to understand where they're working and where they're not working or give people an idea. Or perhaps we can explain most of the cases by a simpler, more visual model, and then sometimes... We can't explain the rest, and so what do we do when there are discrepancies? But I, I think this is one of these big areas right now, and big challenges. You talk about big areas and challenges. In my mind, I kind of envision researchers in their labs working for the next big breakthrough. Is that what you guys are doing? On one hand, yes, we all want breakthroughs. We always want the big thing. But I, I look at a lot of the, the big things now, and like Facebook. Facebook's like the seventh or eighth iteration of a peer-to-peer you know, friend network. 
uh, Twitter, you know, that, that was like instant messaging and you have all these email. You have all of these things that are huge now that aren't exactly breakthroughs, but they're they're big because they're, the time was right, the, the circumstances were right, they had the right sauce, whatever it was. that And the that. technology that enabled it was yes, right. Yes, that's right, exactly. And you, you look at the iPad, you know, there, there had been pen computing going on since the mid-80s. So these things have happened over and over and over again, and sometimes the time is right. Now, so what are those big breakthroughs? We often don't know what those breakthroughs are until, you know, hindsight, you know. It's like, that oh God, was a breakthrough, but, but I didn't call it that when I was yeah, making that's it. That's right. And, and I think there is a rush towards some of these breakthroughs, whether it's with augmented reality. There's a lot of interest in that right now, or self-driving cars. There's a lot of interest in that. Um I think we all kind of want that, oh, things were like this before, and I've done something to make it fundamentally different. Um, you know, academic research and research in general is not usually like that. It's usually very, very incremental and careful. And there's this balance between that careful science and the, oh, my God, we made something big, and we've got this rush to a new startup, and that's really exciting. And I think you kind of want a little bit of the energy from both of those to go together. I love, love, love how you've said that because it's hard work yeah. and it's slow work and it's rarely the big bang. The metaphor I usually like is, is standing on the beach when the waves are coming in. Uh, if you just stand there and you watch any single wave, it's only a little bit further than the last wave. But if you're standing way at the top, looking down and looking at this over several hours, like, oh my God, I was down there before and now it's way up here. It's called the tide, not exactly. the wave. Exactly, and, and when you are standing on that beach, Amongst doing that work, it's very incremental. You're just trying to get past those last little little wavelets. Yeah. And then, you know, when you step back, you go, oh, wow, this is... The... And then you have to step back and examine, oh, <laughs> that area's about to be flooded. We should do something about that. On the spectrum of, let's just say Microsoft, because that's what we're talking about, but you've got your research people that are the out there in five years, you got your product people that are right now, and then you got your end consumers. And so that spectrum of um, how you contribute to both the company and then the world, the concentric circles out, how do you envision that? I mean, how do you um, internalize that, what you do? Um, how does it make a difference? Yeah, I mean, it, it changes at different times. So sometimes that's you shoot for that outside circle of the world, but along the way, you figure out like, here's a stepping stone that I can publish and here's the end. So I'll at least get this other audience of people working on it. And maybe here's a product that I might be able to impact and they'll reach a different audience. And you know, that's sort of leading there. So some, sometimes it's like, I've got this directed thing and I'll do those step stones along the way. Other times it's, it's almost the reverse. It's sort of like someone has come up with this thing that they really want. You, you can give them, you know, beyond that solution. And, and it was just the sort of short term that takes you off in a new direction that you didn't know before. I got into that sort of photo management stuff, partly because talking, because I had that problem. Other people were talking, we were talking over lunch, and we were seeing that. And this was before iPhoto, and you know, before there were any of those organizations. Let, let's focus on this. And we did this for a good five, six years. And that led to a whole flowering of different areas. But that really was in response to some short-term problems that was thinking, I think this is big. And don't you think sometimes that's how um, a lot of big solutions started out as accidents? Yes. Like, I think I'm going to test for this, and it Absolutely. turns out that that medicine worked for that instead. Yeah, in, in, in that field and all, all the other things. In fact, I think it was in Hamming's Turing Award acceptance speech, he talks about how um, that was almost the kiss of death because everybody then was expecting just big projects from him. And therefore, those thousand little tiny projects didn't have a chance for any of them to bloom into something else. So starting with this idea, it's going to be big, can be deathly. So you need to have this mix of you know, those bigger things that people are collaborating on and the little, little flowers blooming. So it's really hard to say, which circle are you aiming at right now? Right. I mean, sometimes it's moving. a moonshot and sometimes it's like, I'm just going to do what, you know. That's right, because maybe right that's going to lead somewhere else. And it's right. going to lead to something big unexpectedly. Stephen Drucker. Thanks for coming in and sharing your passion and your stories and your projects and everything else. It's been my pleasure. To learn more about Dr. Stephen Drucker's work in data visualization and other great things going on in Microsoft Research, visit microsoft.com research. <laughs>